without further ado, because he's speaking twice today and we need to give him time to go home, to go to the hotel and rest. Mm, home. May he have a home in Kenya. <laughs> Media team. Apostle Joshua Selman is the president of Eternity Network International, a Christian-based organization headquartered in Abuja, Nigeria. He's the set man of the weekly service called Koinonia. Widely known for his sincere love and passion for the body of Christ, his meetings are characterized by great and unusual presence and moves of the Holy Spirit, miracles, healings, signs and wonders, workings of miracles and deliverances. Apostle Selman is a carrier of the strange presence and power of the Holy Spirit. The teachings of Apostle Selman are timely, anointed and balanced. They have become a major tool for revival in the lives of individuals and ministries in many nations of the world. With a standing ovation, help me welcome Apostle Joshua Selman. Come on, Kenya. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Thank you very much, um, Reverend Julian Kula. Thank you. Thank you for this profound opportunity. Um, I also want to appreciate every man, every woman of God, every resource person. May the Lord honor you in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe that we're gathered here to experience God in a way that we have not experienced before. And this would demand that our hearts be opened, it would demand that our spirits be sensitive, and then that we position ourselves to receive even that which would be coming from the Lord. Hallelujah. I also want us to honor our Father. Papa, thank you so much. So good to see you again. Hallelujah. Can we lift our hands to heaven and ask the Lord to speak to us right now? Someone is praying from the depth of your heart. The Bible says, for everyone that asketh, receiveth. Go ahead and pray. Ask him to speak to your heart. Thank you, Lord Jesus. For in Jesus' matchless name we have prayed. Father, we thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for Rema Fest 2023. Thank you for Reverend Kula and his amazing team. Thank you for all the servants of God who have ministered before now. Lord, we pray that you speak to us yet again. Grant us illumination, grant us understanding, and we decree and declare that will leave this place transformed, will leave this place imparted by the Spirit. For in Jesus' matchless name we have prayed. Amen. God bless you. Please be seated. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, we had a brief talk with Reverend at the Rotunda, and I was just really appreciating him for the determination and the faith to put up such in my opinion, a national program. This is profound, not only because it is happening in Kenya, but that this program has been able to break the walls of denominationalism to allow people across several denominations to come together, to converge under one name, one banner. I think this is remarkable, and I was truly appreciating him and praying that this serves as a model for many other African nations. Hallelujah. That we are truly stronger when we are together. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. 
All right, let's get to the word. We have a session now and then one other session in the evening, I'm told. And it is my prayer that the Lord will bless us. Uh, there's a lot to share, but wherever we stop for now, we we'll pray and then rest for the evening. If you're in agreement, shout a loud amen. amen. And I hope you can hear me right to the back. If you can hear me, please shout a loud amen. amen. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. We'll start with three scriptures. Um, Daniel 11 and verse 32. Daniel 11, 32, the B part. The Bible says, And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. It says, But the people that do know their God, two things will happen to them. Number one, they shall be strong. Not they may be strong. They shall be strong. And number two, they shall do exploits. Not talk exploits, not wish exploits. They shall do exploits. So the Bible says that the people that do know their God, that know their God indeed, that there is an advantage that comes with knowing God genuinely. One of it is strength capacity the other is the fortitude to do exploits scripture number two john 17 and verse 3 jesus is praying now and the bible says that he lifted up his eyes to the heavens and then he began his prayer by the time we get to verse 3 this is what jesus is saying and this is life eternal that they might know thee the only true god and Jesus whom thou hast sent. Very profound statement. He says, this is life eternal. That eternal life is shrouded not just in receiving alone, but in knowing. This is life eternal. That they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus whom thou hast sent. Scripture number three. Philippians chapter three and verse ten profound scripture by apostle paul this was a communication of his contemplations this was a desire that was in the heart of a man who had done so well as far as revealing jesus and conquering nations for him here's what he said this was at the zenith of his apostolic ministry he said that i may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering be made conformable unto his death. You would think at this point in Paul's life, I hope you know that Paul had a very unique ministry because unlike other people, his ministry literally started with an encounter. An encounter was not an added advantage to his knowing God. The very foundation of his pursuit started by and with and through an encounter hallelujah and here is paul having met jesus having done so well for the kingdom he says my greatest desire at this point in my life is that i may know him hallelujah now a few points as we begin this session there is a way that god designed that man would know him please listen carefully when it has to do with the knowledge of God, we're not given the liberty to invent our strategy to knowing God. There is a predefined way, there is a pathway that has been carved out for the believer. Are we together now? That in pursuit of the knowledge of God, if for any reason you veer off through another route, you might know God, but it will come with a lot of casualties and side effects to your Christian experience. Are we together now? Yes. So there is a way God designed that men would know him. And that anyone who walks in keeping with that pathway will know God in a certain way that translates to a profound and victorious Christian life. We live in a world that is full of people who purport to know God from a religious circle and then, of course, across several other, you know, faith practices. But then we do not see 
the accompanying evidences that follows a man that the Bible says knows God indeed. That means if you claim that you know the God of the Bible measure, you would also have certain evidences to present to the world as tokens. Are we together? Evidences that you truly met the God of the Bible. So it is important for us to know that we are not at liberty to know God the way we want or we choose to. There is a way God designed that men would know him. And this is very important because his way of knowing him is not the only way to know him. Listen, God's predefined method of knowing him is not the only way available. That is why when Jesus came, he said, I am the way, not a way. There are many routes to the pursuit of God. Occultism is a route that can help you explore the realm of the spirit. And in so doing, you will be a victim of several casualties. Just because you are open to the vistas of the spirit does not mean you will encounter the God of the Bible. There are many other spirits that can, ask, that can assist men to access dimensions in the spirit. But if it is not by the agency of the Holy Spirit, there will always be a side effect. This is the reason why zeal must be guided. Because the side effect of zeal is that when zeal is not guided, it can lead a man into an experience in the realm of the spirit where because of your hunger and your thirst, you will encounter any spirit and call it the spirit of God. So a man can be driven by his zeal and through fasting, prayer, consecration, you will dedicate yourself sometimes in a blind pursuit of spirituality. And at the end of that experience, you will come up with many, many supernatural experiences that are not a revelation of God. And you see, because of the, because of the power of the impact that that experience provided for you you would argue with anybody and say I know what I heard I know what I saw but when we gauge your experiences from the lens of scripture we will find you wanting across many fronts this is one of the major challenges with the Christian practice especially across Africa because men and women have ignored the predefined pathway to knowing God and in their blind pursuit have explored the realm of the spirit using different routes and different vehicles and in honor to their passion because the Bible says everyone that seek it find it it doesn't matter what you find there will be a finding to honor your pursuit so many people have contacted familiar spirits many people have contacted um, extra biblical experiences and brought those experiences with confidence and sold them to congregations, sold them to cities, sold them to nations, written books that are a capture of error. Hallelujah. The first thing I want you to understand this afternoon as we explore this very delicate subject of knowing God is that there is a predefined path where I want to be as simple as possible so that we all understand and connect. There is a predefined pathway to knowing God. And I'll be showing you shortly. That means if you desire to know God, you should desire to know God, but that you are not given the liberty of creativity in the pursuit of God. Creativity is only important when you are manifesting your dominion over the cosmos. But when it has to do with the pursuit of God, it is your alignment, your yieldedness, not your creativity. Are we together now? So there is a predefined pathway to the knowledge of God. This is the first point that I want to establish this afternoon. And by the way, let me just bring this that this conference will only have been successful if it affects three levels of people number one the unbelieving world there has to be a part and a portion of this conference that ministers to sinners and the unbelieving world because according to apostle paul he told us that god's desire is number one that all men be saved then the next 
dimension or the next phase of people is that it must affect the church. This is an apostolic conference that seeks to upgrade our understanding to grant us access to superior spiritual knowledge as co-laborers in the vineyard, as people who love God and are committed to our spiritual growth. And then number three, this is why I was so blessed by the dedication, the project that just happened. There has to be an aspect of this conference that ministers to society. I will never advocate a Christian practice that has no point of application as far as territorial transformation is concerned. Because the Great Commission, as we know, has a threefold expression. Number one, to the world of sinners. Number two, discipleship to mature believers. And then number three, to transform territories. If any of this piece is taken out of the way, it no longer becomes the Great Commission. And for a long time, our advocacy has just been planting Christ in the hearts of men through evangelism. And that is very important. But it is the reason why we have sincere people in an environment that is full of decline and decadence. An example of such state was found in the life of a man in the Bible called Lot. Lot was a righteous man. But Sodom and Gomorrah was not a good place. And he still paid the price, even though he was a righteous man. It matters that your territory is also saved, not just your heart. A man can be saved and yet a territory. You see that? Lot was a man who loved the Lord, but the lives of his daughters were about to be ruined, literally because he was immersed in a territory that did not honor God. Hallelujah. So we, this is the apostolic dimension to the Christian faith that God is reintroducing, especially to the nation of Africa. For a very long time, I don't want to go ahead of myself, but if I am asked in an interview to assess the state of the church in Africa, I will tell you that the church in Africa, which has translated to the state of the African nation, um, that state is a symptom of two things, two deficiencies. Number one, the bankruptcy of the knowledge of the true God alongside his ways. That the current state of the church, in as much as there are many wonderful, commendable things like the revival that Africa is spearheading right now by grace across the territories, there are many great things that God is doing in and through Africa. However, the deficiency in growth and stature can be credited to number one, the bankruptcy. Are we still together? The bankruptcy of the knowledge of the true God alongside the knowledge of his ways. And then number two, the state of the church, unfortunately, but truthfully so, is a reflection of the kind and the level of spiritual voices we have across the territory. Hallelujah. If for any reason we have spiritual voices that are imbalanced, ill-equipped, not people who have captured the whole counsel of God, it will produce the various shades of lopsidedness that we have suffered in the church. For instance, rejecting prosperity, for instance, becoming materialistic, these are all side effects. Are we seeing that now? There is a way that the gospel and the kingdom life must be presented such that the believer embraces the whole counsel of God. He becomes an individual of stature. In Revelations 18 and then 19, those two chapters reveal the portrait of what John called the lamb's wife. He says, come and I will show you the lamb's wife. And the Bible said, he showed me a city that was equal in length, a city that was equal in breadth, a city that was equal in height. That is the lamb's wife. No exaggeration. Every dimension to proportion. Are we together? That anything outside of that dimension is not a true picture of the lamb's wife. So I believe that using conferences like this, God is helping us to in love, correct, build, rebuild, destroy, reform, and create through the lens of Africa, a true portrait 
of apostolic Christianity. God is helping us to present to the world once again what a believer should look like, thoroughly furnished. It is for this purpose that he gave unto some apostles, he gave unto some prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And the Bible says for the equipping, the maturing of the saints, that the saints in that state of maturity will do the work of the ministry that we all together will come into the fullness of the stature of the measure of Christ. He says, not tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, nor the slight of men, wherein they lie to deceive. If we're together, say amen. So this is what God is helping us understand. But let me get back to my discussion. That there is a predefined way to knowing God. Now, very quickly... The Bible, the Bible represents the boundary of God's dealings with men. I want you to look up, please. The Bible is not the only capture of the dealings of God with men. You know that by now. There are many other books that did not make it. They were not canonized to become part of the 66 books that we know. They were a revelation of God as given to many people. And the Bible also makes reference to those materials. The book of Enoch, the book of Jasha, the annals of the king, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And all of these materials are pieces. They capture various dimensions of the operation of God. But the Bible says that what is written in scripture is sufficient in partnership with the Holy Spirit to build any believer to maturity and stature. Are we together now? That what is captured in Scripture in partnership with the Holy Spirit will be sufficient. In John chapter 20, when you read from verse 30, the Bible says many other miracles did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which were not written in this book. So there were many other manifestations of Jesus that were not written in this book. 31 says, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that in believing you will have life eternal. That means it is safe for a believer, generally speaking, to limit himself to the truth and the information that is found in the Bible, that that body of knowledge in partnership with the Holy Spirit is sufficient to build you to any stature that you desire. Are we together now? It's important that we have that theological background so that we, it is very unsafe, especially in a world where we have access to the media space in almost unlimited fashions, we must guide our pursuit and the basis for our references. There are people who have consulted a lot of materials that have destroyed their stability and destroyed their pursuit as far as the knowledge of God is concerned. Are we together? Now, according to scripture, please you may want to write this. There are four biblical channels to the knowledge of God. I'm taking my session this way because of the things that I would want us to discuss as we progress. That there are four biblical pathways to the knowledge of God as revealed in scripture. Let me run through this very quickly. Number one, the first way we know God is through scripture. Please write. The first way the believer is mandated and instructed to know God is through scripture. Hallelujah. Scripture reveals the character of God and scripture reveals the methodologies of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3 from verse 15 and 16. 2 Timothy 3, 15 and 16. This is not my call. You won't believe that I've not even started my teaching. I just need us to have a foundation so that um, there's no controversy by the time we start. The Bible says, and that from a child, thou hast known the holy scripture which is able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Let's look at the next verse. Then it says all scripture. How many scripture? All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, 
and instruction in righteousness. To what end? Verse 17. It says that the man of God may be mature. That's the word perfect. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So number one, for any believer who seeks to explore the knowledge of God, the first recommendation is that you consult scripture. This is very important. Number two, we're just running. The second platform to knowing God, as the Bible reveals, is to study his names. The names of God, as scattered from Genesis to Revelation, are a capture of the various dimensions of God that he revealed to men. So when you say Jireh, when you say Sikenu, when you say Rapha, when you say the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, all of these names, you study in scripture that they were mandated to preserve those names and to teach their children the meaning of such names. Because God is great, but in revealing himself to man, he reveals himself dimensionally. Are we together now? And every dimension that is seen and known to man is captured and preserved in a name so what Jireh will do is not the same thing as what Sikenu will do even though it's the same God doing them the way the God of Abraham will operate with you is not the same way the God of Isaac will operate with you even though it's the same God walking are we together now so we learn God by studying his names when you call him Jaira, he does not reveal himself as a healer. That dimension is not captured in that name. When you call him Sikenu, he does not supply all your needs. That is not within the scope of his revelation as captured in that name. Are we together? That the second way we know God is by a meticulous study of his name. Moses meets him in the wilderness and says... What should I tell Pharaoh who had sent me? And he says, go and tell Pharaoh, I am has sent you. I am that I am. And when you read Exodus chapter 6, I believe, Exodus chapter 6, give us verse 1 to 3. Exodus chapter 6. Then the Lord said to Moses, now shall thou see what I will do unto Pharaoh. For with a strong hand shall he let them go. And with a strong hand shall he drive them out of his land. Verse 2. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, follow carefully now, I am the Lord. I wish you could see verse 3. Let's read it together. Ready? One, to read. And I appeared unto Abraham and unto Isaac and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name, Jehovah, was I not known unto them. This is God speaking. That there was a dimension of me that was revealed to Abraham and to Isaac. But by this name, they have not yet known me. We can learn God as we study his name. Listen, do you know that your entire journey as a Christian should give God a name that other generations will learn? He has not stopped naming himself after men and their work with him. That at the end of your life, people can say the God of Pastor Julian, meaning a capture of a way he operated through the lifetime of a man. That no generation should join the cloud of witnesses without leaving a name that the younger generations must learn. How did he come through for you this way? And you tell them the story as captured in a name. Number three, the third way that we learn God as revealed from scripture is by the revelation of the person, Jesus. The third way believers are mandated to learn God is through the knowledge and the study of the person, Jesus. Say Jesus. One more time, shout that name. Jesus. Let the devil hear you. Jesus. Jesus. The Bible says, God who in sundry times and diverse manners, Hebrew chapter 1, verse 1, spake to us in time past through the prophets, he said, had in these last days spoken to us through his son, whom he had appointed heir. Are we together now? So we can learn God by the study of the person, Jesus. Hmm. 
Colossians chapter 1, please, from verse 15. Colossians 1 and verse 15. Colossians 1 and 15. Thank you. I'd like us to read together. We're reading 15. We're reading 16. Are you patient enough to read with me? All right, let's go. One, two, go. Who is the image of the invisible God? Uh huh. The firstborn of every creature. Next verse, please. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. Watch this. John begins his gospel, his synoptic account of Jesus by giving us a very brilliant presentation. All other synoptic accounts began their discourse either from a historic standpoint, giving us genealogies or like Mark, straight into the acts of Jesus. But John took out time to trace his discourse from the divinity of Jesus. He starts by saying John 1 and verse 1. He says, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 2 says, the same was with God in the beginning. Now, I like verse 3. It says, all things were made by him, not by it, by him, the word. And without him, that means outside of his participation, was not anything made that was made. The third way we know God is by the revelation of Jesus. I'll get to that shortly, but let me just finish the rundown of how to know God. The fourth way that we know God as revealed in scripture is through the advantage of experience. Job 42 and verse five. There is a role that experience plays in the knowledge of God. Let's read together. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. The Bible says, oh, taste and see, not just oh, believe or assume, oh, taste and see that there is an experience to your pursuit of spiritual things. Experience can help men know God. This is where the advantage of fatherhood and the advantage of buying through the experience of elders works out for believers. Are we together? That an elder can see, even though Eli, watch this, Eli was in a state, a backslidden state, as at the time Samuel was born. The Bible already told us that his eye, his sense of vision, if your eye be single, your body be full of light. But now Eli's eye had begun to be dim. He had permitted his sons to live in such lawlessness, piling up wrath upon himself and his sons. However, in spite of the fact that he was in that state of spiritual decline, God still used the voice of Eli to call Samuel. When Samuel heard the voice of God, he did not assume, he went to Eli and Eli told him, no, I'm not the one calling you. God had to connect Samuel with Eli to understand him and understand the purposes of God for his life. And then Eli used the lens of experience and said, ah, I know that thing. The next time he speaks, don't come to me again. Say, speak. Even in that fallen state, he was the one who gave Samuel the formula that caused him to hear God that would later transit him to become the mighty prophet. Experience. I can tell you, if you have been saved and you are working with God properly for 10, 20 years, let a naive, arrogant unbeliever not believe that you don't have anything to tell him. There is something about God that pain can teach. There is something about God that shame can teach. There is something about God that disappointments can teach. There is something about God that mistakes can teach. So when you have accumulated this sufficiently for many years, there is something about God you know from the lens of your confusion, your pain, your search, you can help correct a generation from the lens of your experience. Now, if you try to route your knowledge of God outside of these four channels, I can tell you, you are going to meet the devil in his various forms. Because the Bible says, 
Satan can appear as an angel of light. Let me recap myself. That's why I took out time to just set this foundation. That in the pursuit of the knowledge of God, we are only given this liberty and that we do not go beyond this jurisdiction of number one, scripture. Number two, the names of God. Number three, Jesus as God incarnate. And then number four, guided experiences. I think I didn't add that. Guided experiences. Hallelujah. Let's talk about Jesus. The conference seeks to reveal Jesus. Is God teaching someone something already? Who is this Jesus really and why did he come? I think I should start with why he came. Who is Jesus? But then why did he come? The Bible, did you know that from Genesis up until the time Jesus showed up, in many places in scripture, you see that there had been a battle and an expression of confusion and frustration as to who God was. Every time you would see prophets interchange between their knowledge of God and their knowledge of some deity, you could see the uncertainty in many of them, even as they acted. There were many that they credited to God that from the lens of Jesus, we now know that God had no hand in it. Because according to Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 13, that we see in part and we prophesy in part. And until Jesus showed up, no man was given the liberty of a personal relationship with God. So everybody had to depend on what their leaders told them God was. Are we together now? There was no system to verify whether the prophet or the leader was speaking accurately. They had to believe whatever they were told. Let me start by revealing to us why Jesus came. Jesus came to fulfill a threefold assignment. Let's write that down. A threefold assignment. When he walked upon the earth, he came to fulfill a threefold assignment. I would just give it to us very, very quickly. Number one, Jesus came as an accurate revelation and a manifestation of the misunderstood God. This was the first assignment of Jesus. His first assignment was not to die. No, his first assignment was not to reconcile man. It was his major assignment, but not the first. If it was his major assignment, he would have just dropped from heaven, died and left. The reason why he had to allow his entire lifetime to be seen, captured and recorded was because he came for more than just dying to reconcile men. Please understand this. The first mandate, the first assignment of Jesus was that he came as a marking script to correct our prior understanding about God. When you read, I believe that was Acts chapter 17, there was a city in scripture called Athens. And when Paul came to the city of Athens, uh, I think that should be verse 20, I hope, he 20 down to 23. He challenged the people because he saw their zeal and their devotion. They were passionate people, but the Bible says that they built an altar in verse 23 of Acts 17. And they wrote that inscription to an unknown God. Isn't it amazing that today there are people singing to an unknown God, preaching about an unknown God, writing books about an unknown God, even dying for an unknown God. And Paul came to bring perspective to their zeal without understanding. And he told them, I see that you are a zealous people and that is profitable, except that you are worshiping, serving, bowing to, and building altars to an unknown God. Jesus came as a reference point he came as god's vista to knowing him that was the reason why god had to accredit jesus he said this is my beloved son and then in another experience he said whom i am well pleased hear ye him don't doubt what you hear from him don't doubt what you see he's an authorized channel to knowing me are we learning now the first assignment of Jesus as he walked upon the earth, ladies and gentlemen, 
is to help us know God and to correct, to use him as a reference point and a marking script to correct everything the prophets told us God was. So, if the prophet said God is love, we have a right to doubt it until we verify it using the person Jesus. Did we see love captured in his experience? For instance, the prophets would say things like an evil spirit came from the Lord. Now, that was based, we have to be fair on them. They did the best with the level of revelation they had. But now, using the lens of Jesus, we have a right to mark that script because we do not see any evil coming out of Jesus. The Bible tells us that he was full of grace and truth. So we will clap for the prophet who brought us that revelation, but now respectfully edit their understanding using the marking script, Jesus. Are we learning now? Yes. It's not a call to be critical and to be arrogant, unfortunately, like many people. Uh, it's, it's a call to appreciate the fact that we've been now given the advantage of marvelous light. And we can see clearer and we can see their mistakes. There were many things that they attributed to God that now using the lens of Jesus, we see that it was not God at all. It's an uncomfortable truth because it's in the Bible and you'll be afraid to confront it. Confronting it as a man will be error, but using the reference of Jesus is not error. So when the Bible says the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, we have a right to not believe that statement until we find it captured in the person Jesus. Was he compassionate? Yes. Was he slow to anger? Yes. But was he angry? Yes. Proof, he flogged people at the temple. Is that in your Bible? He didn't just go and report them to the authority. The Bible says he made weep and he flogged them and they made reference to his zeal, that the zeal of the Lord has consumed this man. He says, <laughs> is it not written that my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it to a den of robbers. This is a message for another day, that the house of God will always be one of these two, either a house of prayer or a den of robbers. And I can tell you who that robber is. The robber is the thief. I'm not talking of the building. I'm talking of you, that house of God. If you are not a house of prayer, then you qualify to be a den of robbers. Are we blessed? So Jesus came as a correction to our understanding about God. He that told many people believed that God could not be approached. But now Jesus came and when they wanted to drive even the children from him to show that God can reveal himself to anyone regardless age, regardless level of sociological exposure, he said, let the little children come to me and do not forbid them for, for such. That means they are coming to me is a lesson that you must become childlike to know me. Not childish, but childlike. Hallelujah. Let the little children come to me. The second reason why Jesus came was to reconcile all men to God. Very clearly from scripture. John 3, 16, he was speaking to Nicodemus and he said, for God so loved the world that he gave his then one and only begotten son. We know from the intelligence of scripture that he's no longer his one and only begotten son. Today, Jesus has become the first begotten of we the brethren. But at the time, he was his only begotten son. He says that whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have life everlasting. Am I right on that? John 10, 10, the thief cometh not, but for to steal, to kill, to destroy. He says, but I am come that ye might have life and that you have it more abundantly. So the second reason why Jesus came was to reconcile men to God. And that would not happen by an impartation. It would require his death. It would require his blood. It would require his life. Are we together? It is the reason why until Jesus died, I finished a series with my dear people back home that among the many miracles that Jesus performed, there was one he could not perform, not before his death. And that was the greatest need of man, the miracle of administering eternal life. 
that could not happen until after the cross. He could forgive sin. He could heal. But he could not impart eternal life to any man. Because the very structure of eternal life demanded that he would have to die and that his blood would be shed. That he used his blood to purchase redemption for us. That's what the Bible says. The second reason why Jesus came. As simple as this is, ladies and gentlemen, I do not mean to sound sarcastic, but you will be surprised how many people run churches in Africa and cannot articulate with intelligence why Jesus came. We have conferences, we have books, we have all kinds of Greek and Hebrew expressions, but most people cannot tell you with confidence and certainty why Jesus came. The third reason why Jesus came, which is very important to be considering it, I hope, in the subsequent sessions, is that he came as a revelation to man of God's expectation of him. Jesus came as a pattern man to reveal to man how far he fell and God's true expectation for man. Romans chapter 3 now, 23, it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We fell from a standard, a standard of life, a standard of grace, a standard of glory. And Jesus came to reveal to us God's expectation. When he walked upon the earth, he did all that he did visibly and to the seeing of all so that the disciples will capture this as a motivation to all believers that if you do not rise to this standard, you are fallen short of God's expectation. So he said, the verily, verily, I say unto you, the works that I do shall ye do also. He says, and greater works than this shall you do. If I lay hands on someone on a wheelchair and the person arises, you are not surprised as a believer because Jesus gave us that template. That is a possibility that should be captured in the life of a believer. Are we together? If Reverend Julian builds a city literally and built many cities, these are possibilities. We are not in doubt because Jesus already told us that it, these things should be captured in the frame of your Christian experience. So, if a man can rise to become as strong as a nation, a Christian should not be the one complaining or doubting because he already told Abraham, in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. This experience should not be foreign to a believer. Are we together now? Prosperity and finance answers to process, answers to relationships, answers to value, and many of these things. However, there is an advantage that believers have in Christ by this time tomorrow. It's a possibility. That means don't doubt that after this conference, when God gives a man a prophetic leverage over his finances, it does not make sense economically, but when a believer examines this, it's still an agreeable dimension because it is captured five loaf and two fish fed 5,000 people immediately. Now, he did not feed 5,000 people that way every day. So it should not be a doctrine, but that it must be at the back of your... When you now want to feed 5,000 people with five loaf and two fish every day, now you are in trouble. Are we together now? The healer is also called a great physician. So we are saying that we do not negate the law of process, but that in our dealings with the cosmos, we know that there is an advantage we have. There are systems that have been carved out for the believer to become a leverage. One of it, for instance, is a prophetic advantage. By this time tomorrow, and a whole nation was redeemed economically. Are we together? Now, there are many things that Jesus said about himself. I don't want to bore you into you know, with all of those discussions since we are just starting our session. But it's important for us to study what Jesus said about himself. The wisest way to know a man is to listen to that man speak about himself. And according to scripture from a theological standpoint, there are 10 statements captured in the Gospels and in Revelation that Jesus said about himself. Can I run through that list with you? Let me give it to us. 
10 statements that Jesus said. One, I'm so sorry I'm going to rush, get the teachings. Praise God. Um, because what I really want to talk about for this session, we're not even there yet. So, number one. All right, let's, let's get straight to number one. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He said this about himself. John 6, 35. I am the bread of life. Number two, I am the light of the world. John 8, 12. Jesus said this about himself. It's important to respect what he said about himself. The truest statement about Jesus was what he said about himself. Number three, he said, I am the door. John 10, verse 7 and verse 9. I am the door. Number four, he said, I am the good shepherd. You find that still in John 10, verse 11. I am the good shepherd. Number five, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. John eleven twenty five. 25. I am the resurrection and the life. Can I continue? Number six, he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. John 14, 6. I am the way and the truth and the life. John 14, 6. Number seven, he said, I am the true vine. You find that in John 15, verse 1 and verse 5. I am the true vine. John 15, 1 and verse 5. Now, when we go to Revelations, we find the three other statements that he made about himself. Number 8 now, I am Alpha Omega, beginning and the end. You find that in Revelations 1 and verse 8. I am, and then you also find that in verse um, 11 also. I am Alpha, Omega, beginning and the ending. Number nine, what did Jesus say about himself? Revelations 1, 17, I am the first and the last. Powerful. I am the first and the last. Revelations 1, 17. Finally, Jesus said about himself in John 1, 18, I am he that liveth, was dead, and I am alive forevermore. I am he that liveth, was dead, and I am alive forevermore. Revelations 1, 18. Ten profound statements that Jesus said about himself. And you have to believe all of those statements if you really want to walk with Jesus and you really want to know him because every one of those statements are keys in the spirit and a time will come when you will need the revelation behind those statements to compel those doors to be open. For instance, when sickness plagues your body, you need the revelation of the resurrection and the life. Hallelujah. When you stand before obstacles, and it seems like there is no passage, one of the dimensions that you need to find is he as the door. Isn't it amazing that he is the door? And anywhere you see the door, that is your access point. So you stand in the midst of confusion and here he comes as the door and he becomes your safe passage out of any predicament whatsoever. Now, for the purpose of our discussion, ladies and gentlemen, from an evangelical and an apostolic dimension, there are three dimensions of Jesus that are, must be known for any believer who seeks to be a person of stature. Please write this down. There are three dimensions of Jesus from an evangelical and an apostolic dimension that when you want to become a man and a woman of stature, you want to be used by God to spearhead revivals, you want to see souls saved, you want to see destinies transformed, nations transformed, there are three cardinal revelations of Jesus that you should never escape. Are you ready for that? Number one, Jesus as Savior. Number two, 
Jesus as Lord. Number three, Jesus as Christ. Please write it. Jesus as Savior. Jesus as Lord. And Jesus as Christ. The end time church is a church that will walk gallantly upon the strength of these threefold revelations. Captured within these revelations of Jesus are the keys to territorial revival. The keys to taking over nations for Jesus. Establishing his purposes. Becoming that mountain that is upon, exalted above every other mountain. Jesus as Savior. Jesus as Lord. And Jesus as Christ. Hallelujah. Let's touch them very quickly and then we'll pray. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Uh. No shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Do you know the reason why the world sees the Christian faith as a nuisance to civilization? Because there is a portrait of Jesus, a very inaccurate portrait of Jesus that has been sold to the nations that has no applicability not to the life of any individual nor to society and so people are corporately kicking jesus out and anything that looks like him because they are interpreting jesus from the lens of those who claim to know him and our witness has been poor because it's been an ineffective witness laced with gaps of ignorance are we together now Yes, we have proposed a Jesus that finds no point of application to children, finds no point of application to professionals, finds no point of application to a society until we are able to capture this threefold dimension of Jesus. Let me the next few minutes because this is the core of my teaching now, this session. I want to reveal to you Jesus as Savior, as Lord, and as Christ. And then we pray and prepare for the evening. It matters the protocol of your encounter. If you encounter Jesus as Christ, as a first encounter, you are in error. Because the protocol of encountering him must start with him being savior. Now I need to say this because don't just tell me you have met Jesus. Who did you meet? If you met the miracle worker, I appreciate your encounter, but you have not met Jesus. There is a protocol. Are we together now? That the foundation of anyone's encounter must be Jesus, the Savior. There are many people today who have met many dimensions of him and that is wonderful. They have met the one who can open doors. They have met the one who can give prosperity, as important as that is. They have met the one who can make you wise, but they have not met the one who saves. And our churches are full of costly assumptions that longevity of stay in church does not translate to an encounter with the Savior. An encounter with the Savior must be a definite encounter, an intentional encounter that has proof to show. I can tell you from the authority of Scripture there are many people who have not met the Savior. Because when you meet the Savior, it will affect you and affect the way you relate with your world. When you have met the Savior, you will never give up on anybody who is still breathing. There are implications to meeting the Savior. Your salvation is just one of the benefits of meeting the Savior. There is an imprint of that impact upon your spirit that regardless how far an individual has veered off the things of God, if you know the potential that is captured in Jesus the Savior, you can believe God for the salvation of nations. We are very quick to conclude on people because we have not encountered the Savior. You see, 
When you know how much and how far he went, for you to know Jesus as Savior, you must understand the extent of his love. He says, I have loved you with an everlasting love and with my loving kindness, I have drawn you. The Savior is powerful. He can reach down to your child somewhere, drinking and smoking, and you would have concluded he will fish out that child. The Savior can come to Kenya to look for one person. With the same zeal, he will come looking for a congregation. The Bible says when the Savior revealing, adumbrating the ministry of a Savior, that a shepherd will come and risk his life for just one sheep. When we are quick to conclude on people, it's because we have not met the Savior. And so we point fingers at people and there are people who are discouraged and the world tries to interpret what we call love from the lens of our hate, the lens of our conclusions over people. There are three kinds of ministries that will rise before Jesus returns and we must be careful to keep a heart of love if not we will hate those ministries number one when a madman in Gadara becomes an evangelist there are ministries that will be in that similitude that you once knew him as a madman now he's an evangelist I hope you will have the grace to believe Jesus had delivered him number two a prostitute at the well who now becomes an evangelist. I hope when you see her calling 10 cities, calling people to come and see a man, I hope you will believe that she's really met Jesus. Hmm. Because you will see these kinds of people rise in Kenya, people you had concluded upon, and yet, they will meander into a church service and the grace of God will rest upon them. Jesus the Savior will be revealed to them that a man you know had been in a life of decadence and whatever it is, once you are there concluding, I know that Jesus died, but he did not die forever. He only died for three days. Don't talk about the Jesus who is dead, whereas he's already alive. Listen. I'm not endorsing licentiousness, but the reason why the church in Africa cannot rise is because when we peg people to be something, we are not even aware of the business they are doing with God as far as their transitions are concerned. We continue to name them after yesterday and say, but you are pre were you not the madman? It's true. I may have been the madman in that cave, but do you know what Jesus did? He came to gather a just for me. Just because you were not in that service does not mean he did not come. Listen, how does Jesus finish from a great crusade with a crowd? Then he goes to a well and he's spending time with one woman. The portrait of worship was not taught in a crusade. It was taught between the Christ speaking with one woman with the same zeal. The, the, the theme for salvation, John 3, 16, it came out of a discussion with Jesus and a controversial Pharisee. Listen to me. We must love Jesus with all our hearts, but our hearts must be open to allow those who do not know him to know him and to be used by him. Who would have believed that the chiefest persecutor of the church would become the apostle who would write two-thirds of the New Testament? I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, before Jesus returns, you will see phenomenal manifestations of the Spirit of God. Non-Christians, some of them would be in their room and here he comes, the Savior, coming to give them encounters and would build them like Paul 19 years in the wilderness of Arabia. And you will see men you once knew, men who could not have carried fire. You may be concluding on them, but you will see the mighty things that God will be doing in their life. I believe that he is able to save to the uttermost. 
I have seen God save cultists. I have seen Jesus come through for families. I have seen idol worshippers throw away their shrine. I have seen people who were zealous serving the unknown God. But the moment we gave them a chance to know Jesus, you know the reason why evangelism is poor? We are not even sure he's Savior. We largely do evangelism just to appease ourselves and free ourselves from the guilt of not looking spiritual. But the truth is that it is not from a standpoint of conviction. When you know Jesus the Savior, you will become an evangelist immediately. The woman at the well was never told to go and call people. The impact of meeting Jesus the Savior, the Bible says she left her water pot, she left everything down and she ran. Can I tell you, when men meet the Savior, they become too grateful to be quiet. Too grateful to be quiet. Too grateful to be quiet. The way we have to beg and encourage people, go and win souls. Talk to someone about Jesus. The average believer's passion is not evangelical at all. And it is not because we are bad. It is maybe largely a bankruptcy of an encounter with Jesus the Savior. So this is what he's able to do. He can turn Mary of Magdala, remove seven demons out of her and incorporate her to serve. He can turn the life of this woman at the well. So the madman in Gadara was an evangelist all the while. No wonder he does not want to let your family rest. No wonder he does not want to let your son rest. He has seen what you are not seeing. You are seeing a stubborn child whereas the devil is seeing an evangelist over Kenya. And he's saying, instead of going after two million people, pursue this young boy. While you are seeing someone who is not getting a job and feeling you are not serious, he's seen an entrepreneur that can open up the gates of finances for two million people and he's saying afflict his finances, let him not rise because in his rising is the rising of many. Say Jesus the Savior. Jesus. One more time shout it, say Jesus the Savior. Jesus the Savior. Every believer who will even be a believer in the first place must encounter Jesus the Savior. You have encountered many dimensions, but I ask you lovingly, have you encountered the Savior? The Savior. There are many people preaching because they inherited ministry, not because they encountered the Savior. They were just most available at that, as at the point of ordination. And so that they be rewarded for the longevity of their stay, they were incorporated among those who oil was poured upon. But the truth is that they've not encountered the Savior. That's why I raised that song. No shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. No wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. Hear me? You imagine, ladies and gentlemen, that everyone gathered of the tens of thousands of people here represented, that everyone had an encounter of Jesus the Savior. Imagine if every day this size of Kenyans were saved. Did you hear what I said? Listen, we have reduced evangelism to be an activity of one great superstar. So our assignment is to build the stage and gather people and wait as helpless believers, waiting for one great man of God to come in hope that he will draw many. Whereas with the singular encounter of Jesus the Savior, everyone can have the potential. Our fathers will tell you, men like Maurice Sorullo, Men, those you call God's generals were God's evangelists. It was because of the impact of their knowing Jesus as Savior, not just as miracle worker. It was at the point of revealing him as Savior that miracles came. It was at the point of revealing him as Savior that influence came. There are many people today in search for power, miracles, grace, in isolation to the revelation of Jesus as Savior. You do not need an impartation if you are not prepared to let the nation see the Savior. 
Hallelujah. Preachers, respectfully speaking, let's be careful as we lay hands on people's heads. Let's verify their passion and what they want to use that anointing for. Just because they are holding an envelope in front of us does not mean that we satisfy that guilt by laying hands on them. Let us verify that they know Jesus and they will reveal Jesus as Savior. Can I tell you the truth? Everybody Jesus healed died. Everybody Jesus fed died. The only ones who had victory over death were the ones who had the privilege of knowing him as Savior. Kenya, I believe in the healing ministry. I believe in deliverance. I believe in prosperity. But in order of eternal priority, if Jesus as Savior is not restored back to our pulpits, if Jesus as Savior is not, we have conferences where we teach and the Bible says, God, there is no need even advocating church growth. You do not need members if you are not prepared to reveal Jesus as Savior. Because God adds daily, not just as many who will give, as many who should be saved. So for every time you see an increase, it is that Jesus has brought somebody who needs to know him as Savior. Kenya, I want to challenge you. No matter what we call a revival, no matter what we call an outpouring, if it does not culminate to the revelation of Jesus as Savior, we will be found wanting. Thank God for the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. Thank God for the manifestation of all the charismatic things that are captured in church. But the simplicity of the gospel is what we have ignored to our peril. Our fathers whose lives have become models for us today were people who became, they began their ministry with a simple advocacy of revealing Jesus to the nations. They didn't know much, but they knew him. And when they stood upon those crusade grounds, the idea was not to cause short legs to grow. The idea was not to cause the dead to come back to life. It was to see the Savior revealed. And every evidence that needed to be on ground, God insisted that that evidence would come. Can I tell you, you want to see the power of God? Concentrate on the revelation of Jesus as Savior. More than just being an anointed man of God. When I began my pursuit with God, it was not about power or miracles. It was a sincere desire to make my contributions to see the nation, see him revealed. First, a savior. The Jesus the world needs is Jesus the savior. There is Jesus the many other things, but in order of eternal priority. Let's restore Jesus the savior to our pulpits. Let's restore Jesus the Savior to our crusades. Unfortunately, many crusades right now across Africa, and I say it respectfully, they end up being just a display of gifts. And at the end of it, we know the man of God who was invited, but we do not know the Savior who sought to be revealed. If in this conference you end up knowing Joshua Selman, clapping for Joshua Selman, giving seeds to Joshua Selman, and I failed to reveal Jesus as Savior, I wasted your precious time and made a fool of you leaving Nigeria to come here. The excellency of the ministry here is not just measured in the charismatism of our speech, but to the degree to which we got out of the way and we allowed the Savior to be revealed. Jesus the Savior. The Lord spoke to me years ago and he said, Son, if you will let men see me, there is nothing I will not give you. Can I tell you, when you see some of the things that God is doing in our lives, it's not that we are the best. It's not that we are the smartest. We are just determined and committed to reveal him, especially him as Savior. And in so doing, he's made up his mind that you will not go down since your assignment is to make men see me. It is amazing. Now listen, we're about, we'll, we'll, we'll find somewhere to wrap up. I know that I've stretched you a bit. Are we together now? Listen, ladies and gentlemen, there are many people driving our cars who are not saved and we don't care. While they are driving our cars, we're editing books about Jesus and the person driving is not saved. 
There are many of our staff in church who are not saved and we don't care. They are editing our sermons and our manuals and yet we do not care about their salvation. Today, if I come here right now and I know you have a lot of expectations for prophecy, deliverance, healing and miracles and you will have that. But if I end up preaching like this and go back to Nigeria, you will leave disappointed. You will be happy that I spoke about Jesus but that desire, you wanted more. I mean, where is the power? Where is someone shouting some where this is how we have so brought Jesus out of the scene and replaced him with all shades of charismatism not T.L. Osborne not Billy Graham not Maurice Cerullo these were men whose lives the anthem of their lives was to reveal Jesus especially as Savior don't tell me you're a man of God show me how many people have seen Jesus the Savior through you don't tell me how long you've been in ministry. Show me how many people have met Jesus the Savior through your life. Mm. Let me speak to the younger generation who are looking up to our lives. Be careful with the deception of charismatism. As much as there are two ways to follow in scripture. Number one is to follow them. Mentorship who through faith and patience. Number two is looking onto Jesus because there are dimensions that experience cannot capture. You only follow men as they follow Christ. So there are two people you should be looking at. The one you are following and the one he's following. If you ever find out that the person in front of you is not following Jesus, there is problem with that followership. Now, we're not doing a pastor's conference here yet, but, but this is just a, seri a, a, a statement that is from my heart. Many people, Africa, Reinhard Bonke cried from Kenya to Nigeria to Uganda to Ghana with a simple theme, Africa must be saved. That man packed up stadiums, not with, from, from an honest standpoint and with all due respect to him, now listening to us among the cloud of witnesses. When we vet this man from a standpoint of leadership, administration, are we together? Intelligence, the dexterity of intellect. Many of them were found wanting and yet God covered for their weaknesses because they were determined to reveal Jesus. They were not the best in terms of the eloquence of speech. They were not the best in terms of leadership and organization. They were obvious flaws around their lives. But because they made up their minds that in spite of my limitation, I will do my best. The Lord covered for their weaknesses. Raise helpers to come. You have not yet seen power until you are determined to serve Jesus. You will be sitting down and someone will give you a plot of land and give you acres of land. And Jesus will say, this is God's see your desire to reveal me impartation should come because of this ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you and you shall be witnesses not celebrities I said this because I just saw a wind just moving around we are going to pray Ask and now give the nations to you, O oh Lord. That's the cry of my heart. Distant shores and the islands will see your light as it rises on us. Ask and now give the nations to you, O oh Lord. That's the cry of my heart. Distant shores and the islands will see your light. Jesus, the Savior, the one who loves you in spite of yourself, the one who is ready to forgive, not forgive rebels. I wish I had time to walk this thing about Savior. Forgiveness is useless without brokenness and repentance. I want you to know this. The mercy of God does not work arbitrarily. The mercy of God only responds to brokenness and repentance. Without brokenness and repentance, you need tolerance, not forgiveness. Tolerance is the fortitude to accommodate a limitation that will happen again and again and again. 
Forgiveness is granting pardon to one who has come to a point of recognition that I do not have the power to save myself, but I have the willingness to be saved. The prodigal son could not help himself, but he could come to himself. And he said, how many hired servants as my father? And I am here. I just sense that there is an anointing that God is looking for evangelists. I know that there are many other impartations, but I just sense as I'm speaking now that there are people, God is saying, I've been showing you this in dreams. I've been showing you this in visions. I've been telling you that that I desire you please help them so they don't injure themselves and I pray that as many in this crowd in the name of the Lord Jesus who are committed to revealing Jesus as Savior may that grace rest upon you now may that grace rest upon you now hallelujah You cannot reveal Jesus as Savior until you understand the gospel. For the sake of time, read 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. That is the most theologically balanced presentation of the gospel by Apostle Paul himself. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which ye also have received and wherein ye stand. Verse 2. By which also ye are saved, he says, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain. Verse 3, it says, For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sin, according to the scripture. Verse 4, And that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day, according to scripture. The gospel of salvation is a declaration of the Father's love to mankind and creation revealed in and through the substitutionary sacrifice of Jesus to the intent that whosoever believes, believes in his incarnation, his earth work, his death, burial and resurrection. The Bible declares that whosoever believes that he would not perish but that he will have the life of God. It's called Zoe, God's life. The Bible says in John 3:17 that God did not send his son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. This is the simplicity of the gospel. Kenya, let's get back to the crusade grounds. Jesus is coming. Kenya, let's get back to every social media platform that can help us announce and reveal Jesus. The era of celebrity Christianity marketing Joshua Selman's has come to an end. It is time for flesh to die and for Jesus to be revealed. It is impossible that he is revealed and then we are relegated to the background. But the assignment is not the marketing of self and ministries and denominations and our pedigree and all kinds of things. I may decrease, John said, that you may increase. If the world never sees me and they can see the Savior, I am satisfied. If the world never hears me and they can hear the Savior through me, I am satisfied. If I never preach any intellectually sound sermon, but I can let you understand through the frailty of my speech. Our fathers cried and they served God. They died for the Savior. Today we are living for ourselves and wondering why the Savior is not showing up in his power. The Savior only shows up when he is revealed. There is the unbeliever in your office. There is the unbeliever somewhere in your house. Your husband is going to hell. Your wife is going to hell. Your members are going to hell although they are giving you money. Thank God for their money but they are still going to hell. Giving is not the secret to salvation. No. Giving is only profitable as a kingdom mystery if and when the Savior has been revealed. Thank God for the magnificent structures we are building and I'm an advocate of that. Thank God for the glitz and the glamour that surround the church. The church should not be weak and beggarly. But ladies and gentlemen, my first assignment tonight is that among the many revelations of Jesus that has been deficient in the church, which is responsible for the prevalence of error, darkness, lust, 
pride the average believer today does not understand the theology of salvation he does not even know whether he's saved or not there are still debates as to what condition must a man satisfy to be saved we have written many books about ourselves but not about Jesus or we have written about Jesus just the healer as wonderful as that is I will leave the Savior here and we'll wrap up but I need to also show you the Lord and the Christ if you do not have this tripartite revelation you can never access genuine spiritual power and you will never be an end time voice the revelation of the Lordship of Jesus will leave that for the evening but just to give you an introduction of it when he is revealed as Savior you are no longer a sinner there are two implications to his being revealed as Savior the spirit of faith is finally planted in you because the earth is not for the Savior the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof there are four things you need to know when you know him as Savior land territory the mind control systems resources when he's revealed as Savior the hallmark of your knowing him as Lord is your submission in obedience why do you call me Lord Lord and will not do what I say when he's Savior he's not just the one doing when he's Lord you are the one doing he truly becomes Lord in your life when you've lost the ability to say no that everything he says is yes that is a realm in the spirit called Galatians 2 20 I have been crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ that lives in the flesh in me and the life that I live today in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me the reason why we have many people polluting the altar and many people who are bringing reproach to the name of the Lord in various forms is because although they have encountered the Savior they have not encountered Lord the proof that you have encountered Lord is surrender not receiving surrender if your life still has your will revolving at the epicenter of your own life you may have met the Savior but not Lord what happens when you meet the Savior I know we say we give our hearts to him but theologically speaking that is incorrect no something is wrong with that heart why should he take it he's giving you his life that's what happens but when it has to do with the revelation of Jesus as Lord that is where you cast your golden crown because there cannot be two lords in the room there cannot be two kings in the room so even though you are an elder you will lay aside your accomplishments and your achievements and you will bow to only one name only one king and only one Lord when you pass through that gate of understanding his lordship then you come to Jesus the Christ this is when you truly understand the anointing the power of the spirit defy this protocol and you will produce an ill-equipped generation of believers many have jumped from unbelievers to wanting to know the anointed you can know the anointed even when you are not saved through the lens of one who has known the anointed by receiving healings, receiving miracles, all the products of the anointing. But you want to follow that pathway to knowing Jesus, the Savior, the Lord, and the Christ. All that I shared with you was Peter's first sermon. He said, let it be known to you, O Israel, that this same Jesus you have crucified has today been exalted Lord and Christ and 3,000 people came because a man followed that protocol and the church began to multiply please hold hands together I want to wrap up for this session can you hold hands with someone Kenya let your children and your children's children not get to a point where Jesus becomes a foreigner in your land because there is an advocacy of anything else but Jesus the Savior may it never happen that our children will ask us who is Jesus and we say I don't know ask my grandfather ask my great-grandfather he was the one who had all the crusades 
But now I can tell you what an app is. I can tell you what AI is. I can tell you what technology is. But don't ask me about the Savior. We need to restore to our pulpits, our billboards, our mass media, Jesus the Savior. There is minimal controversy when the Savior is revealed. All the confusion about what we believe and what we do not believe is because we have emphasized our beliefs, not the Savior. Did you know that regardless what denomination, the moment Jesus the Savior comes, he's a binder. Denominationalism dies when the Savior is projected. Because I may not agree with certain things, but we all agree that the world needs Jesus. Jesus the Savior. One of the secrets of unity, the unity of the church, is to project Jesus the Savior more than Greek, Hebrew principles, practices. When the Savior is exalted, this denomination can come and agree and say, even though we do not agree on certain things, because it is the Savior we are projecting, there is minimal controversy. The church is greatly divided because everybody is advocating his revelation, Everybody's advocating his rema, and there's nothing wrong. I'm not trying to sound sarcastic. Jesus the Savior. Hold hands in one moment. Pray for Kenya. Pray for Africa. Pray for the nations. In one minute, this is a solemn assembly. Jesus, you be lifted higher. Go ahead and pray. Higher, be lifted higher. Jesus, you be lifted higher. Higher, be lifted higher. Pray for Kenya. Let the Savior be reintroduced again. Go ahead and pray. Someone is praying. Pray for every church you know. Pray for every man of God you know. Pray for every conference you know. Pray for every revival platform you know. Jesus, we need you as the Savior to be revealed in Kenya. Revealed in South Africa, revealed in Nigeria, revealed in Ghana, revealed in Europe, revealed in America. Maranatha, come again as Savior. Come again as Savior. Save our children, save our wives, save our husbands, save our members, save our nation. the back. Lift up the sound of prayer. Let the Savior be reintroduced back. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus name we pray in Jesus name we pray one of our fathers of faith when he turned 80 years he said for the remaining part of his life knowing that the curtains were already folding you see the fathers have a way of seeing that the cloud of witnesses that their days are numbered and he said for the remaining part of his life he wants to be able to give Jesus 8 million souls before he goes to the Lord. Not buy another car, as important as that is. Can I tell you, may we not build churches that will be full of sinners that are never saved. May we never hold conferences that becomes a celebrity galore without Jesus being introduced. May we never be polished in our eloquence and our communication and we preach men into exalting self and take Jesus out. Let us restore Jesus.
the Savior. This is the apostolic order that was commissioned to the church. As, as vast as Paul was in knowledge, the moment he saw the heathen, the first thing in his mind was Jesus as Savior. Healing came as a way of revealing Savior. Deliverance came as a way of convincing men to believe in Savior. Every other thing finds its value in the life of an apostolic Christian with respect to your passion to see Jesus revealed. Let me wrap up. Father, thank you. You have decided to make Jesus the emphasis of this conference and we thank you. Thank you for all of the speakers who have introduced various perspectives and dimensions of Jesus. Lord, among the many things that you have taught us this afternoon is the need to restore and to reintroduce the Savior, to introduce him to our government, our children, our spouses, our nation, our educational systems. And we pray and obtain grace that everything that wants to drive Jesus out of our lives and our civilization, we come against it in Jesus' name. We declare that forever, Jesus becomes and remains the epicenter of our church work, our Christian pursuit, our education, and everything in between. You believe that? Shout a loud amen. amen. God bless you and see you in the evening. Everybody hold up. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can I just please give some order?